Okay, this is the 18th lecture for Psychology in Action. Uh, still getting used to this um, style of technology for uh, podcasting lectures, so do bear with me if it goes a little strange. Uh, today we're going to look at inferential statistics and experimental design. Um, so inferential statistics is starting to introduce you to some of the language, some of the terms used to develop statistics which are involved in making predictions about, or, or inferences if you prefer, about um, data collected. So we've done descriptive, that was the mean, the mode, the median, and, and um, the range. So this is moving into something slightly more complex. But today's one is more of an introductory one and we'll get on to the more involved levels of how to actually do the maths in subsequent weeks. Um, a little bit of maths today with a standard deviation. And we'll talk very briefly about design and how that relates to the choice of statistical tests because we're coming back to that in future weeks in more detail. And we'll finish off with a short introduction to Chomsky and some of the theories on language. So types of data we're going to look at today, the four main types of data that are used in collecting statistics are nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio. When it comes to nominal data, that's data in which a number is attributed to a category, almost at random, and there is no mathematical value or worth or, or depth to the number attributed. So the example you've got here of hair color, let's say you're going to survey the hair colors of all of the um, students at the college and you need to keep a tally sheet of this so how many blondes how many gingers how many brunettes so forth you decide on a number so as per the example on the screen blonde people will be number one brunette people number two ginger people number three bald people number four and there'll be other numbers for gray-haired people and all of the rest of it so you just go around ticking these respective boxes when you see people <coughs> when you come to work out your statistics you'll be looking at how many ones, how many twos, how many threes, but those numbers don't particularly mean anything in relationship to each other. So in no sense is a brunette worth half as much as a bald person because brunette is number two and bald is number four. So the two and the four, they don't relate to each other in any way. That's what we mean when we say there's no mathematical value to these categories. You could do the same with gender, the same with ethnicity, the same with religion, with a whole raft of different subjects where you're just giving a number to th this box and a different number to that box and another number to yet another box and people will fall into one or another of these various different boxes that you've set out as to which one they fall into. And so that is nominal data. Ordinal data is based upon where people come in a particular order in a sequence. So a very easy, straightforward example of this is where somebody comes in a race. It could be a foot race, it could be racing horses, racing bikes, racing whatever. But there's going to be someone who's first, someone who's second, someone who's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. And so you don't necessarily, if you know that someone is first, you don't necessarily know how quickly they ran the race only that they came first. Likewise, if someone is second, you don't know how far behind the first person they were. All you know is that they were second. They could have been a minute behind, a second behind, an hour behind, you don't know. You just know that they were second. So you use the order in which people came. Uh, I would guess probably everyone in the class at some point in their life will have filled in a Likert scale, where you're given a, maybe a set of five or 10 or however many boxes, and one box will be agree strongly and another one will be agree slightly or neutral or disagree slightly, disagree strongly, that sort of thing. Or as with the example you've got on the screen there, degrees of illness, do you feel mildly ill, moderately ill, acutely ill, chronically ill, so on. So you tick a box on a scale and that puts you on that scale and some people will be higher up the scale than other people will be. So they might, if you've got a big group of people, there might be lots of people who tick box number one, not many people tick box number three, a couple of people tick box number five, what have you. So you get a sense of how many people tick which box. 
that you've given them. And usually on that sort of thing, they are the ones ticking the boxes rather than you deciding which box they ought to be on when it comes to Likert scales at any rate. So that's ordinal data. Interval data is based on the assumption that there is a, um, a zero, but that zero doesn't particularly mean anything very much. It's been arbitrarily de decided. So the example you've got here is uh, an IQ, sorry, a Fahrenheit temperature scale. So there is a zero degrees Fahrenheit. But if we look at the history of how um, thermometers were designed and that sort of thing, it's relatively arbitrary. Somebody said, oh, this will be zero. And then there's five degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, up and up and up. And there is no particular relationship to the numbers so if you are sitting in a room that is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you don't feel twice as hot as somebody sitting in a room that's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. You might feel a little bit hotter, but it, you couldn't say definitely twice as hot or definitely four times as hot as someone sitting in a 10 degree room. It, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, likewise, the example you've got there of the IQ tests, if someone has an IQ of, on the screen here, 120, that doesn't mean that they are definitely, objectively, measurably twice as clever as someone with an IQ of 60. Doesn't, it, 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 it's a bit more ambiguous, a bit more um, arbitrary than that, so it's, it can't be put in quite such concrete terms. And there aren't that many interval forms of data in the world to use, certainly not in psychology. IQ test is a good example of one in psychology, but there are not many other examples where you would be using interval data. Ratio data is slightly different in that you have a definite zero in a ratio scale in which someone who scores zero has nothing of the thing that you're measuring. So if you were measuring, for example, amounts of money in someone's wallet or purse, it's perfectly possible that person could open up their wallet or open up their purse and have absolutely no money in it. So they would score zero, somebody with one pound would score number one, somebody with five pounds would score number five, so on upwards. And you could say in a very meaningful sense, a person with five pounds in their wallet has five times more money than somebody with only a pound in their wallet. There is a, a relationship between those numbers that makes sense, it has a meaningful reality to it. Um, other examples you've got there, um, measuring unemployment rates, measuring calories, where you can say that these things have a concrete number, a concrete ratio, one to the other. And ratio is the idea of this thing relating, this factor A relating to factor B, where you could say factor A is twice as strong as factor B, or factor B is five times stronger than factor A, whichever way around it goes. And there's a different, definite relationship between those things. Um, if any of you like drinking cocktails, you're making a cocktail usually on the basis of ratio. So you might have um, twice as much gin as vodka, a relationship of two to one in a particular drink. Or if you're not a, an alcoholically inclined person, you might need baking a cake and you might need um, twice as much sugar as flour. So again, a relationship of two to one. There is a, a meaningful relationship between these numbers, these concepts, that's ratio data. Okay, so far so good, hopefully. Those are your four factors. So you will be, in your experiments, in your different groups that you're doing around creating these language tests, you'll be using one of those forms of data. So you might decide for example, if you want to time how long it takes for people to do a particular activity, like learn a, a new word or a new sentence in a foreign language, then that would be, pause for you to think, dot, 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 ratio data, because time, if it takes them one person a minute and somebody else three minutes, there is a definite ratio that it took one person three times longer than it took the other person to accomplish the task. So that would be ratio data. You might decide 
Um, you want to measure people by um, their ability to get words right. So you give them uh, 10 words to, to learn and test them a few minutes later and see how many words they've got correct in the, in the foreign language that they're learning. And either they'll go, well, get 3 out of 10, 5 out of 10, or 9 out of 10, or however many it is. That, again, is ratio data in that they could score zero. They could get every single one wrong. That would be a zero. Whereas if the person who gets eight has twice as many correct as the person who gets four. So there's a relationship, a definite relationship between those numbers. So again, that would be ratio data. There are other ways in which you could consider um, data. So if you, again, you're doing the test, how many words do people get correct? You could have that as ordinal data. So who got the most correct? They came first. Who got the second most correct? They came second. And so on down to whoever got the least correct, who would be in the final category. So again, different ways in which you could measure and create data. And how you do it is, is well, largely up to you and your group. You can discuss different ways of doing it, bounce ideas around, phone each other up or contact each other on the social media and discuss how you want to design this. Now I'll say at this stage, obviously we don't know what's happening with this quarantine business in terms of how long it's going to last. Um, and I'm juggling the lectures around in the hope that you'll be able to do the experiment when we are back, which touch wood will be after Easter. And you can do the experiment then, which might mean we have to put down, put the date back for the accomplishing the assessment a little bit, perhaps. We'll see what happens. Worst case scenario, if the chances of coming back to college get pushed further and further back because of, of coronavirus, then we'll devise a way in which you can conduct the experiments, perhaps with people online, so they could fill in answers on an online questionnaire or do an online test. So you never actually have to be in the same room as the people that you're testing and then you can collate the answers that way. And potentially you could do that experiment from the privacy of your own home. But we'll look at the practicalities of that as we go along. But at this point in time, just keep thinking about the practical details of how you want to do the experiment in the hope that we will be able to do it in class when we can all meet up again after this, this period has passed. Right, that brings us to standard deviations. Now, standard deviation is a way of measuring statistical data. Once you've collated all your data, you put it all together, you've got everyone's scores on the test that you've made them do. You put it all together and you start, you've worked out the mean, which you will hopefully instantly remember, is where you add everything up and divide by the number of people that you've added together. And that will give you an average number to me. So the standard deviation looks at how far someone in that group, you pick one person at random in that group and work out how far they are away from the average score. Are they dead on the average score? Are they much higher than the average or much lower than the average? Or what have you? So it's looking at how far they are away from the average score. And this is where we start to use um, some symbols. Now the little sign you've got there in the middle of the um, third bullet point as we go down, that sort of circular sign with a tail on it is called a, a sigma sign. It's a Greek letter from the Greek alphabet. It's, there's also another, um, this is how it's written in the lower cases. When it's written in the higher case, which you'll see in a second, um, it means something different. But when it's written in the lower case, like this circle with a little tail on it, then that represents standard deviation. So that's just the symbol used to represent standard deviation. And we're going to show you the formula for working this out, which would be much easier to do if we were all in the same room at the same time. And I could go around and give you advice on this, but we'll do the best we can under the circumstances. Um, part of working all of the standard deviations out involves working out the square root of variance. Now you can do square root by hand, but it's often quite a complicated process and it's much easier to do it on a calculator. 
If you don't know where the square root button is on the calculator, let me know and I will help you find it whether you're using an old-fashioned type of calculator or you've got one on your mobile phone or you're using one available on your laptop. Then quite where it's placed in the array of buttons will vary from one to another. But let me know and I'll help you find it. Okay, so in the white box on the screen you can see an equation. And we're going to work our way through this equation one step at a time. Uh, it may look a little bit perhaps off-putting at the moment, but it will make sense when we break it down to one step at a time. So SD means standard deviation, not sexual disease, as it does in medicine, but standard deviation. And we're going to work this out now. Just to explain the symbols here, we've already mentioned the lower cap symbol, the circle with the little tail, which means standard deviation. That thing that looks um, on the screen a little bit like a letter U with a longer tail on it, or an upside down letter H, is another Greek letter, mu. Now mu means the mean of a group. It's just a, a symbol used to represent the mean. The thing that looks a little bit like a letter E, a little bit like one, is also called a sigma, just to confuse, but that's the um, uppercase version of a sigma, the capital letter version of a sigma, rather than the lowercase version. And the capital letter version of a sigma it means it's sum of, so the sum of everything added together is sigma. Okay, now the white box you've got on the screen, everything is worked out. This is the, these are the answers, but I'll explain how those answers were reached step by step. So if you need to pause the video for a minute, go and get yourself a very strong cup of coffee or what have you, and come back, fair enough, and then I'll explain. giving you a chance to pause the video and restart it. So imagine you've got a small group of people, four people, and they've all done a spelling test. They've not done particularly well on this spelling test because they scored two, two, three, and five correct out of a spelling test. And those numbers, two, two, three, five, are what we're going to use. So in the white box, they're the ones in the, the column on the left-hand side. Now, if we add them all up, 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5, we get 12. And we divide 12 by 4 because there are 4 people in the group. So 12 divided by 4 is 3. Straightforward maths there. 3 is the mean. And there on the screen, you've got that Greek letter mu, which represents the mean. So mu is the mean. And on the white box, you'll see that the Greek letter mu also appears on a couple of places in the white box so far. So we're now working out sigma, Greek letter, as follows. So in the first row, going across, reading horizontally, um, you can see the number 2 in column X, the very first column. So in, in, in there, so if you can find that, hopefully then you can see where we are. Now, in the next column along, the middle column, you can see at the top it says deviation x minus mu. So it's x, in this case for the first line, the number is 2, minus mu, and we've just worked out that mu is 3. So 2 minus 3, and that gives us minus 1. And you have to keep it in that order of 2 minus 3, you can't switch it around and make it 3 minus 2. You've got to go in this fixed order, otherwise you come up with a totally different answer. So going in that order, we've now found 2 minus 3 equals minus 1. Now, top of the third column in brackets, you'll see bracket x minus mu bracket squared. And hopefully you'll remember from your school days that squared means you times a number by itself. So 5 times 5 is 25, 10 times 10 is 100, and so forth. That's squaring. So, going back to the um, writing on the screen, brackets x minus mu, brackets squared. For the first line across, this means minus 1 times minus 1. Now, just to confuse everyone, if you weren't already aware of this, 
if you times minus 1 by minus 1, what you get is the number 1, but positive rather than negative number 1. So far so good, hopefully. So on the bottom row, slightly easier example, where you've got 5 as x. Now 5 minus mu, that would be 5 minus 3, gives us 2, which you can see at the bottom of the middle column. And 2 squared, 2 times 2, is 4, which you can see at the bottom of the third column there. Now, if you add up all of the numbers in that third column, bearing in mind capital sigma, that one that looks a little bit like a letter E, yeah, the sum of all of the numbers in that third column is 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 4. That gives us 6. So lots of nice small numbers here to keep it manageable and what have you. So continuing with this, you now have to divide 6 by the number of people, the number of scores. And there's four people, so n, number of people, is 4. So 6 divided by 4 is 1.5. If you're not sure, do it on the calculator, and you'll see. 6 divided by 4 is 1.5. And that answer we've just got there, 1.5, is called the variance. The variance is 1.5. The last step we need in this is to find the square root of 1.5, and it's said earlier, much easier to do this on a calculator than to do it with a pen and paper or do it in your, in your head or with your fingers. Much easier to do it by calculator. If you find the square root of 1.5, you will discover that it is 1.22. So that gives us the standard deviation, that little Greek symbol for sigma again, is 1.22. So far, hopefully you're okay with following this. If you're getting a bit of a headache, go back, listen to it again. And obviously not everyone is fully comfortable with math. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a while to, to get the swing of it. So listen to this bit of it as many times as you like until you feel that you've got a grasp on it. Once you're okay, move on with the video because you can play this back and forth like any YouTube video. And so, once you're ready, we come here. Now, what I'm going to suggest you do for this is pause this screen, find yourself a piece of paper, write these numbers down, get your calculator out, and start following the steps by rewinding this video a little bit so you can follow step by step, but with these numbers from this screen instead of the other numbers from the previous screen. So these numbers here simply represent Bunch of people, seven people, n equals seven. And you've gone up and asked them how many pets, how many cats and dogs and goldfish and gerbils and, and whatever else they've got. And each person has told you how many pets they've got. And so you're going to try and work out the standard deviation for this set of data. So if you have a crack at that and work it out, when you're ready, come back to this PowerPoint. Um, YouTube thing, whatever you want to call it, and play the rest from there and we'll continue on. Um, I'm not going to give you the answer to this in this video because the idea is that you can have a go at it and then you can contact each other and say, well, I've got this number and somebody else says, oh, I've got a different number. And you can work out who's right and who's wrong. Um, perhaps if whichever one of you has got it wrong, the others can explain to them how to do it right. Hopefully it will get to the point where you're all doing it correctly and you feel comfortable with this. This year you learn how to do it by hand. Next year when we use a computer package called SPSS then you, the computer will do it for you and it's just a case of me explaining to you which buttons on the computer screen, which icons you click to make SPSS do this for you. But if you don't know what it means, what steps the computer's gone through, then all you'll get is a number, and that number won't necessarily mean a lot to you, which is why we do it by hand in the first year, so you can get some sense of what the computer is doing when you click the various icons on the screen next year. Okay, so once you've, you've finished giving a go at this set of numbers, come back to the video, and we'll move on. 
Now, this grid here is a very basic one with only a few tests on it. There are much bigger, more complicated grids, but they're often so big they're very difficult to see on the screen. Much, much easier to see if you've got a very large sheet of paper with it all on, which we can't really do at the moment at any rate. And we're going to keep this basic just to introduce these terms. Hopefully some of these you will be familiar with from some of the handouts you've had earlier in the year giving lists of statistics. You'll, even if you don't know what exactly what these are, you'll remember the words from the earlier ones. So we'll just stick with this short version at the moment and go on to the more complicated versions later on in the course. So one thing you will need to do is decide, as we were discussing last week, what kind of test you want to do. Now, we're going to ignore the correlation column today because you're not doing a correlation. The Spearman's row is only there to familiarise you with the words, not because we're actually going to do it yet. So between subjects, that's where you get a group of people and you split them into and group A does an experiment under one condition and group B does an experiment under a different condition and then you compare the results between people in group A and people in group B. Repeat subjects, which is also referred to as within the subjects, is where you get one group of people, a big group of people, and you make them all do condition A and then you make them all do condition B. That's the difference. So you as a group decide which one of those you want to do. Split the class in half or get everyone in the class doing one thing and then get everyone in the class doing a slightly different variation on the experiment with uh, a, a different um, variable. Now, once you've made that decision, you then think about what type of data do you want to use. Do you want to use nominal, ordinal or interval? There are other tests for ratio which we'll be talking about in a future lecture. So if you want to go for nominal and you're doing between subjects, you would use a, a chi-square test. If you're doing nominal and you want to do a within or repeat subjects design, you'd use a binomial test. If you want to do ordinal or interval, with comparing group A to group B, you'd use a man whitney test. And if you want to use ordinal or interval data, where you get everyone to do condition A and then get everyone to do condition B, you'd use a Wilcox and T-test. At this stage, I, I dare say some of you will not know what those things are. Some of you might have read around already, but others might not know what they are. We will explain each one of these things over the next few weeks as we go along, how to do them, why you would do them, how you would write up a report about them, that sort of thing. So we will go into detail. So this week it's just flagging up these words getting you familiar with them. And again, you might want to take some time to contact the rest of your group and say, well, shall we use this type of data? Shall we do that type of design? And then you can start to think, well, actually, yep, we'll do it this way, we'll do it that way. Therefore, we might need to use a chi-square or a Wilcoxons or a whatever. And you'd be deciding these things for yourself ahead of time. Okay, that's the maths for today, over and done with. So we'll move on to something slightly more interesting for you, hopefully, more engaging. Chap in the photograph here is Noam Chomsky. And he is a, still going strong, born in 1928, still going strong at the moment. Um, obviously very old and very frail now, but still going on. He is an American psychologist and philosopher who has written very extensively about language, about politics, about social structures, about the mass media, about 101 other subjects. He produces no end of books, gives lectures all over the place. He's done lots and lots of lectures on uh, YouTube, which are recorded. So if he's a person who interests you, you can go onto YouTube or one of those similar types of social media service and find him talking directly to you. His style of delivery is a little bit dry, but as, as long as you kind of bear with it, you'll find he's a very interesting man, has lots and lots of ideas to put out there. Now, the ideas of his that we'll be looking at for the purpose of this um, set of modules, um, set of lectures rather, and the experiment is his ideas on language, rather than his ideas on politics and all these other things. So when it comes to language, he is one of the big names in psychology, one of the first people who's put ideas out there about how language is acquired and used and developed. Not everyone agrees with him, but then that's true of absolutely every other psychologist. No matter who we think of, there will be somebody somewhere who disagrees with them. 
So his idea was that there is a part of the brain which he referred to as the LAD, the Language Acquisition Device, the LAD. I don't think he was trying to be intentionally funny, he just called it the LAD. So in your brain, there's a bit of your brain which is the, is the LAD. Now, biologists don't point to a particular bit. Biologists will say there are several different bits of your brain, in different parts of your, of your brain, um, which all relate to language, memory, pronunciation, all sorts of other bits. So should you ever suffer a stroke or brain damage, hopefully you never will, but should you, then you might lose, some people, as some people do when they have strokes, they, they forget words or they lose their ability to pronounce words, or they can perhaps pronounce words but lose the ability to read them. Um, they have to relearn these things. The ability to relearn is referred to as plasticity, which kind of means your brain bounces back from damage, basically, and learns new ways of doing things sometimes involving a different part of the brain than the original bit of the brain that was involved the first time around when you could do something. Now, Chomsky says we're all born as babies um, with our brains capable of these things. Now, that doesn't mean there might not be some people in the world born severely brain damaged who lack the ability within their brain to develop language, but he's talking the vast majority of people, not those tiny number of people born tragically with brain damage. So it's down to the brain structure. It's also affected by factors like genetics, diet, which has a huge impact on your brain and your brain's ability to function. Um, whether you're taking medication, whether you're using drugs, drinking like a fish, all those kinds of issues that have a big impact on the structure and functioning of your brain. So some of it is from birth, but there's also factors that happen to you in life that alter the structure and the functioning of your brain. Some of it things you're in control of yourself, like your diet, and some of it things that tend to happen to you as a result of a biological clock, like puberty and menopause, and these other factors that kick in whether you particularly want them to or not, and restructure and reshape the functioning of your brain. Syntactic knowledge, if anyone is unfamiliar with that term, is our understanding of the structure of language. Things like nouns, verbs, pronouns, adjectives, which words to put after, so the order in which a sentence goes. So we know instinctively, if, if you're hearing someone who's only just learning English as a foreign language, um, they may be getting the words in the wrong order, so you know what they want to say, but you're also conscious that they're, they're saying it in a very strange way, because they, they haven't quite grasped yet which order words go in in English, they're more used to the structure of their own native mother tongue. They haven't quite picked up a foreign language yet. Likewise, for those of you, if you've ever learned French or German or Spanish or some language, it can take quite a while to get used to which order words go in in another language. But Chomsky says our capacity to, to grasp the idea of syntax, the idea of grammar and structure and the way in which words relate to each other, is something we're born with. It's in our brain from the get-go. It's not something that has to be forced into us. It's naturally there and develops as we get older and as we go along. Now, we'll have a, a pause for a bit of a meander and exploration. And obviously, if we were all in class, we could be discussing this and bouncing ideas around. And I'd be asking you what you think about these different things. So if you would like to pause the video for a few minutes and sit and think, well, what do I understand about language? What do I think about language? Have I learned foreign languages? Am I good at it, bad at it, all of that kind of thing? By all means, have a think to yourself or rattle off an email to one of your friends in class and see if they share your points of view. That's not quite the same as being in class and having a discussion, but close as we can get to at the moment. Now, when we're thinking this question, what is language? It's not an easily answerable question, but we'll look at some of the factors that people like Chomsky and other researchers like uh, a Russian chap called Lev Vygotsky have mulled over and considered over the decades. And you might agree with them, you might disagree with them. Chomsky says that only humans have language, at least on this planet. He's not, he doesn't comment about Martians and Daleks and whatnot. He's just thinking about human beings and the species we know about on this planet. Now clearly dogs go woof and cats go meow and all sorts of animals communicate with each other. 
He's not saying they don't communicate with each other, quite clearly they do, but what he's suggesting is that the ways in which other animals communicate isn't really language in the same way that humans have it. So he's saying we all communicate, cats with each other, dogs with each other, horses with each other, but humans do it in such a complex and involved and sophisticated way that we are a great distance removed from the types of communication that other species of creature on this planet have. Not everybody agrees with him. Some people, some theorists argue that other species, at least some of them at any rate, also have language, but that's a, a topic we can leave for a future lecture. Hopefully we'll be all together then, and if we're not, we'll just do it again by podcast in the way that this is. So what are some of the factors, only some of the factors, that we might say human language has that possibly other languages don't have? And this also becomes a question within different types of human language. So not only Chinese and Polish and French and Italian and Dutch, but also sign language, death sign language, Makaton, which is a sign language used by a lot of people with learning difficulties, for example. Uh, what about computer languages, computer programming languages? What about creatures like parrots and minor birds that can imitate human language? You know, Polly want a cracker, that kind of thing. Does the bird have language or is it just making noises? Because parrots will also imitate the sound of a phone ringing, for example. So does the bird understand what a telephone is when it makes a telephone noise? Well, you'd, you'd guessed probably not really. It doesn't really understand what a phone is. And the same question comes, if, if the parrot says, Polly want a cracker, does the parrot really understand what it's saying? I'll leave you to decide that for yourself. But we'll pick up on some of these issues that are listed on the screen. And um, you can think not only does this apply to all forms of human language, but does it apply to things like parrots and minor birds and what have you talking? If a computer is talking, the voice is coming out of a computer or out of a robot, does the robot have language? Or is the robot more like a parrot repeating noises? So, features of language. Um, one is symbolism, and these don't go in any particular order, these are just kind of put out there in a the special order. Symbolism. The whole point of language is that a noise coming out of my mouth, hopefully my mouth, means something. It represents something else. It's a symbol of something. So when I make the noise dog, you understand that that is symbolic of one of those four-legged furry things that goes wolf. In a different language, it would be a different noise, a different sound, but mean the same creature. So all of the words we use are symbols, noises, that symbolise, represent something else. Cats and dogs and love and hate and houses and cars and, and any number of a million, million different things. Our language represents something. A feature of human language particularly which Chomsky emphasises, is the notion of seemingly endless possibilities. That a parrot might learn, let's say, ten words, for argument's sake. Could it learn a thousand words? Possibly not. Can it make up brand new words of its own? That becomes highly debatable. Would we even understand if the parrot made up brand new words of its own? But I, as a human being, can make up brand new words of my own. So if I want to make up a word, zibble, what does zibble mean? I have no idea at the moment, but I could decide that I am going to write a script for Doctor Who and it's going to involve a brand new alien and I'm going to call that alien a zibble. And just as once upon a time, somebody, Terry Nation, wrote a script and made up the word Dalek. And no one had ever heard the word Dalek until Terry Nation made it up, but now millions and millions of people all around the world know exactly what a Dalek is. He created a new word. So the endless possibilities is that we are not limited to a particular number of words. You, you open a dictionary, there's thousands and thousands of words there, but new words get added to the dictionary all the time. Every few years they add in extra words, because we make new words up as we go along. That's what humans do, we make up new words. So there's no obvious limit 
hence the word seemingly, but there doesn't appear to be a limit to how many words could exist in the human language. We could just make up more and more and more and more as we go along. Modal independence is an unusual one. Again, Chomsky says this is very, very human, in that we can shift our language from one mode, the spoken word, into other modes, such as the written word. And we can understand that a word written on a page is the same as the sound that comes out of our mouth. And at one level it's not. Clearly, squiggles on the page are not sound. But at another level, a deeper level, we understand intellectually that the squiggles on the page equate to the noise coming out of our mouths. And just as we can move from the spoken word to a squiggle written on a page, in deaf sign language, hand gestures become a way of conveying words. You could perhaps come up with all sorts of other ways of changing a language from spoken into something else. You might want to have a crack at interpretive dance or something like that as a way of expressing language. So we can move between different modes. They're all language. They all mean the same thing, but there's different ways of conveying language. Uh, consciousness is an interesting one. This is where we come back to the parrots and the robots. We are conscious. Well, I am. I don't know you lot, but we are conscious. We know when we're talking. We intend to talk, we mean to talk, and this comes on to the next one as well, intent. Yes, you could be dreaming and saying things and then we could ask, does the sleeper really know they're talking out loud? Possibly they don't. No, so they may not be intending to talk because they're asleep. That's where it gets into a bit of a grey area. But in both cases, sleeping or waking, a person has consciousness. They're aware. They've got to know what words are, know what words mean learn them, acquire them as you a baby learning the language, as, a, as an adult learning a second, third, fourth language. You've got to know what they mean, you're thinking about it, you're conscious of it, you know what you want to say to the person who's listening to you, and maybe you succeed, or maybe they don't really understand what you're on about, so you try again and you try again, and all of the time you're ex exercising and exerting your consciousness because your language is tied up with consciousness. Now, if we had a lot of time, we could sit and discuss some very abstract philosophical ideas about the extent to which language actually shapes and structures consciousness. Uh, we could get into things like the um, wolf sapper hypothesis, but I think for the moment we'll leave that to a future lecture. But you might want to look that one up and just uh, kind of do a little bit of background reading and find out whether you think that is a, a, a plausible idea or whether you think the wolf sapper hypothesis is, is rubbish. Different, different psychologists have different views on that one. So intent. Mostly communication is intent. I want to say something to you and then I say it. I intend to say it. Now there are things like um, what, what Sigmund Freud called parapraxis, um, everybody else called a Freudian slip, where you mean to say one thing but a different word comes out of your mouth and you end up saying not quite the thing that you meant to say. Or, and some of you may have experienced this, but most of you, where you're thinking something and then you suddenly realise you've just actually said it out loud. When you see the look of absolute horror on the other person's face. You didn't intend to say it, you were just thinking it, but somehow your brain has, your brain has turned your mouth on without you realising or intending that you would speak out loud what was just a thought in your head. So intent isn't always present in language, but the vast majority of time we intend to say what we say. And it's quite interesting to think about things like parapraxis and what that reveals when you accidentally say something that's not what you wanted to say or even didn't realise you had said it in the first place. Consistency of meaning, the noises coming out of my mouth need to mean the same thing each time I make those particular noises. So every time I make the sound dog, I am always refer referring to the four-legged furry thing that goes wolf. I'm not going to suddenly use the word dog to refer to some to an elephant. 
because that would confuse the hell out of people. Communication requires that the other person I'm communicating to understands the same language. That what I mean by those sounds is what they mean by those sounds. Now clearly, some, especially in English, which is a very difficult language for this, there are some sounds that have lots of different meanings. So if I say the sound dog, I could mean the four-legged thing that goes woof, or I could be talking about what naughty people get up to when they go dogging in car parks. Or I could be talking about stalking someone, dogging their footsteps. Or I could be saying someone's really ugly, they're a right dog. I could be using that word to mean more than one thing. However, the person I'm talking to will hopefully know that the noise dog has lots of meanings, and they'll be able to guess which one of those meanings I'm intending because of the context in which I use the word. And that's a whole other thing, context and language, which is a very complicated area. But if I keep randomly changing the meaning of words, it's going to get to the point where no one will know what the hell I'm on about from one day to the next. And therefore I cease to be able to communicate with them because nobody knows what I mean anymore. And lastly, at least for this list, there are other factors, but we're keeping it shortish. Grammar. Grammar is structure. Again, nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, all of that. Word order. We understand that you can't just randomly put words in any old order and have other people understand what you're trying to say. You've got to say things in a certain order, a certain structure, a certain way language changes according to how you use it. We all know that. So even if you're not really sure what the difference is between a verb and an adjective, in order to explain it to a school teacher, you would nonetheless, when you're talking, your mind has already long since, long ago, years ago, grasped the difference. So even if consciously you would struggle to explain the difference, you're so used to using language that you automatically use it in a way that other people understand what you're saying. Even if sometimes you mispronounce a word or you get you're so excited you accidentally put things in the wrong order. Nonetheless, most of the time we use grammar correctly and other people understand what we're using because we put the words in the right order, in the right way, and we've conjugated them, which is to do with how you change the ending of words and things like that. So we have used it correctly. But again, if you're learning a foreign language, often you'll make mistakes early on because you won't quite necessarily know how the grammar in that language works and sometimes you'll get stuff in the wrong order, or you'll say something that sounds really funny to other people who can speak it, because they can see how you've made a mistake. And hopefully they will correct you, but you know, we grasp grammar. Now, in this question of do cats and dogs and horses and whatnot have these have language, does it, well, if a dog's going woof, 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 woof to another dog, presumably the other dog understands what it means, but is there a grammar? Is there an order in which a dog has to go woof, woof, woof in a certain way, in the same way that we as English speakers or Polish speakers or Chinese speakers have to put words in a certain order? We don't know. We just don't understand enough about what dogs mean when they're going woof, woof to be able to understand it, if there is a structure, if there's possibilities. Can dogs make up brand new words? Can they do a whole new type of woofing to create a new word? We just don't know. So the assumption, you, know, you could say it is an assumption, by people like Chomsky is that other animals don't do these things. It's possible, for all we know, maybe dolphins or whales or what have you do. But we just don't understand enough about the noises they make in order to really grasp the detail. Which is why we're tending to assume Chomsky that it's, it's humans that do this, rather than other species. So the syntax we learn, and this is why one of the reasons why Chomsky thinks it's biological rather than a learnt thing, is that hardly any parent sits down and reads a dictionary to their baby. He explains to them thousands and thousands of new words. Sits there and explains the intricacy of grammar and syntax and language order and nouns and verbs and pronouns in fine detail. They'll get some of that at school. But by the time they get to school, most kids have already understood it. They may not know the difference between a verb and an adverb, but they know how to use language correctly, even if they don't know what those fancy terms like verb and adverb necessarily mean. 
So Chomsky says this is this is a sign that language is biological. Our brain is primed to learn structure from the instant we're born. And yes, Japanese has a different structure to um, French or to Lithuanian, but they all have a structure. And Chomsky argues that deep down there are similarities between the structures of all human languages. And that's caused quite a lot of controversy because some linguists very strongly disagree with that. But others agree with him and think he's correct. But deep, deep down, there are certain similarities between all languages in terms of how they're structured, how they work, how words are put in certain orders, all of that kind of thing. Theorists like Vygotsky and Skinner and lots of others suggest that language is much more learned by encouragement, reinforcement, reward, punishment, systems like that. And that if a child were neglected or abandoned or raised by wolves, they would not have language. And if there have been cases where kids are raised by wolves and chimpanzees and various wild animals, and then they're rescued years later, and often it's very difficult for them to learn language, human language, which has learned to dispute. Some people like Chomsky say this is a clear sign that their brain has been neglected for so long that by the time they're being taught it, it's a struggle for their brain. Those parts of their brain have sort of atrophied from lack of use. People like Vygotsky say, well, clearly it has to be encouraged and taught and learned, and maybe the teaching techniques are not very good. Or another argument is that were those children abandoned when they were young because they had some form of brain damage and the society in which they grew up was very uncaring towards people with brain damage and so the reason they're not very good at human language is because they never would have been very good anyway even if they were raised in a normal home rather than being left in the jungle and raised by wolves or, or what have you. Lots of arguments and debates on that one. But uh, an additional part of Chomsky's argument is that even if you only teach your kids a small number of words, which is what most people, parents do, children will pick things up so quickly on their own, it's suggestive to him that their brains are adapted to do something even without very much input from parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, whoever else. It's around the child when they're very, very young. An interesting point of debate there, perhaps, and something we can pick up on either by email discussion or when we finally get back to meeting each other in class. So next week we'll pick up on things like parametric and non-parametric testing. I'll show you how to use a, a chi-square, which is a bit of maths, but I'll break it down into add this number to that number, multiply that by that number. So it's step by step by step, and we'll talk a little bit more about planning your experiment and pick up on a couple of other language theories that you can think about and start adding elements to your write-up for your laboratory report. Thank you.